Okay, so this text is by Mark Twain, uh, first known by Samuel Clemens, but I believe he took the name Mark Twain because it, it means two measures under the water, and that's where it's dangerous, under the water. And so it's quite applicable. His name is quite applicable to this very, very short excerpt that we've got from Life on the Mississippi. I just entitled the excerpt a wonderful book. You could have, I could have titled it something else. And so he's, he's got a, the image of a, a steamboat should, might come to mind. And it, underneath the water, how, how much can you see under there? And if you're a river pilot, you need to see as much as possible. And if you can't see it, like if it's maybe Mark 1, Mark 2, down into the, the water, things get murky. And I think that's why he picked the name, is that that's where things get a little bit murky. Um, and likewise, Mark Twain's fiction is, on the surface, pretty easy to follow. But he's also a, a bit of a subtle writer at times. So hopefully we'll look at one or two of the, of the subtleties. And I think this particular piece is all about looking into the water. And so if you remember what we looked at last time, when we were talking about simile and then metaphor and conceit, we talked about how in the episode Friends, the guys didn't really want to talk about, really openly, about what they meant. For example, they didn't want to give their ulterior motive for why they might kiss, right? So they went into this metaphor about the comedian. And metaphor could be used that way. But it could also be used another way, a really important way that metaphor is used. It's just so simply people can s understand what you're talking about. For example, most of us aren't river pilots. We don't know what it's like to be on the Mississippi, and we, we're, we're one of these people on the border here, on the edge looking out of the water. We're not up here somewhere or wherever it is that the captain is. I'm not sure which way this boat's, uh, which way it's headed. Um, I'm imagining this is the front, so I imagine the captain's up here somewhere. But we have no, generally, most of us have no sense of what it's like to be a river pilot. And so, often an analogy helps you to understand something that you don't know in terms of something that you do know, right? Everybody's read a book. At least <laughs> back in 1883, all of Mark Twain's audience would have read a book, right? And so they know when he's talking about the river, uh, it might be a bit not clear to them, so he shows it in terms of a book. And you can see in the very first line that he calls the water, the face of the water, a book. It became a book. He didn't say it was like a book, that would be a simile. He said it became a book. So he's really clearly dealing with metaphor here. And he's saying a number of different things about how you can just look at a book um, as if you're looking at the pictures and you don't really understand the content of the book. That would be very much like a passenger who looks at the river and thinks it's pretty. But the river pilot uh, looks at the river and sees the detail like, uh, and understands it in a deeper way, like a reader would. And then he's, he's also a very good reader, so he takes a really good look at the river. So he's like a, a reader who can really understand the details of a, uh, a book, and for example, you know, he makes this comparison here, he sees the faint dipple on the surface, and it's an italicized passage. So you can see that he's taking his metaphor and he's extending it into an extended metaphor or a conceit, just as the, the guys in Cheers, uh, sorry, in the, the clip from Friends did, by taking that metaphor of the comedian and extending it um, in the way that we looked at last class. And uh, then in the next paragraphs, he talks about the way he used to see the river. All beautiful, pretty. And then he talks about how he sees it now as a river pilot. And how it's not necessarily pretty. But notice everything that he says about it is really important and practical. So something being aesthetic or pretty or beautiful isn't there, isn't as important as it, um, you appreciating it in a way that is practical and may, may not be pretty, but it's really important. 
And I think that's the main point that he's making. Now, I've added this little bit just this morning, so you may not have seen this, but I wanted to show the way that I tend to work with a text, which is with colors so I can see the structures. And so here I highlighted the metaphors and I suggested a few things here, circle this metaphor and the conceit. You know, so we've got the metaphor here and it turns really quickly into a conceit, so right away we've got that. And I also circled here that this is more like the thesis statement, this is more or less uh, the idea that he's, he's making in the next couple of paragraphs. And of course that he's using an analogy. One of the main strategies here is use of analogy. And a metaphor is a type of analogy. Then what I've got is the way that, and I, I might have to make my, yeah, make the page a little bit smaller here. The way that he looks at the beautiful river as if he were somebody who couldn't really read a book. He sees the pretty side of it, and then, I mean, that's all very nice, and it all seems positive. So it's pretty pictures in a book, in a sense. Then in the next paragraph, he uses repetition because he takes the same things and he describes. So he's using repetition and description. Those are the two rhetorical strategies as well. They're part of this comparative uh, analogy strategy. So he'll take the descriptions here and he'll repeat them down here, but he'll do the positive, pretty description, and then he'll do the negative, realistic description. But what's really interesting about this text, I think, again, and here's where Twain is quite subtle, is this seems like he's saying that this is positive and this is negative. But in fact, I believe what he's saying is that this is overly positive. It's a bit too poetic. It doesn't really help people, right? Whereas this is prosaic, he strips the language of all the poetry, but he's saying that's way more important. So it's a bit of a reversal, he's, you know, it's a fairly subtle point that he's making. And I won't go through all of these comparisons, but you can see, for example, the somber shadow that fell from this forest was broken in one place by a long ruffled trail that shone like silver. A lot of that is given so that we can appreciate the beauty of it. But what would we do with it? Um, it would be pretty. We might take a picture of it if we're a passenger. But it, it's not the type of description that one river pilot would give to the other river pilot. That wouldn't, wouldn't help them. Whereas here, he picks it up because he, he says that we've got this silver, and we see silver streak in the shadow of the forest, and so he repeats shadow of the forest. So you can see that there's a repetition here, right? Um, and yet there's also a description, and there's also a comparison. So he's using all of those strategies at the same time. You know? And this is what language is like. Language is exceptionally complicated. And to analyze it requires some clear thinking. And so sometimes it's, it's, it's so difficult that it, it's helpful to have color coding. So you can see that this part here is being repeated here. He says that silver streak in the shadow of the forest is the break from a new snag. And notice the language is very basic, it's monosyllabic, it's blunt, it's not, it's sort of drained of its poetry. But it's not simple. It's not that it becomes simplistic though, because the point he's making is really important. He says, and the pilot has located himself in the very best place he could have found to fish for steamboats. Well, nobody goes fishing for steamboats. So right away, he's got, he's got you thinking, what, what does he mean? Well, probably uh, people are, have died in a boat, the boat's capsized, or it's, it's gone into the water, it sank into the water, and possibly people have died. Right? And so, you know, if you got your fishing rod out and you got what was at the bottom of the, the river, you might fish for a steamboat. You might find a steamboat down there. And that's grim uh, because the sort of sacred duty of a pilot is to be sure that his passengers arrive safely. It's like a bus driver. I mean, man, it's really important that the, that the driver knows how to drive and that the driver pays attention. 
right? It's a, it's a really important uh, duty, care, duty of care that these people have. And so this is really um, more important than the poetry part. I hate to say that as a literature it, a teacher, but it is. And so you can see what he's doing here is he's taking this sort of fluffy, overblown poetry and he's, he's draining the language of the poetry, he's making it prosaic. And he's sort of repeating certain things, but his description is much different. It's more blunt, it's more practical. And it also makes you think, because you have to think about what fishing for steamboats mean. We can see a repetition here and here, and it's even more funny because he gets very poetic here. It's almost like completely overblown with long words, dissolving lights, drifting steadily, marvels of coloring. And then you get down to here, it's that tall dead tree. Monosyllabic, blunt. With a single living branch is not going to last long. And then, how is a body ever going to get through this blind place at night without a friendly old landmark? So the river pilot has to be not just aware of what's happening on the surface of the water, but they have to know where the trees are that can remind them about where they are on the river. And if it's dark, you may not be able to see the river surface, but you'll be able probably to see a tree, right? And so yeah, the, the river pod has to pay attention to that. And it's very, um, very practical, and he leaves you with a question which makes you think. Whereas here, it's very long-winded. You can see there's like six lines versus three. Um, and yet, it doesn't really help a river pilot any of this. It might help you if you wanted to take a photograph and you were a passenger, but it doesn't help the river pilot. And ultimately, it's really important. It's more important that these guys do their piloting safely than, you, than that you get a nice picture of the river. Partly to underscore this importance, uh, he has in his final paragraph another analogy. He connects it a little bit to the previous part when he talks about the lovely flush and beauty's cheek break that ripples above some deadly disease. Because previously, if you remember up here, he talked about the faint dimple on the surface. So you have a little bit of, a, of an echo. Just as you had a, an analogy between the river pilot and a careful reader, now you've got the analogy between a river pilot and a doctor. And the same logic about analogy applies. Not all of us know what it's like to be uh, on a riverboat. I've never been on a riverboat, right? Uh, if you live on the Mississippi, probably you, you do. But Mark Twain wasn't writing just to people who were on, on, on rivers, right? And so not everybody knows what it's like to be on a river, but everybody knows what it's like to go to a doctor. And also think about it in terms of a doctor. That's a really, really important job to everybody. All of us will, will agree that doctors are really important, right? And so we need doctors. And likewise, if you're being on a transport, a bus or a plane or a train or whatever, we need people who will do that job um, really carefully. And so likewise, we've got the doctor, so we can understand, you know, what a doctor's doing um, better than we can understand what a river pilot's doing, because we probably never necessarily met a river pilot, but we've certainly met doctors, right? So this is why I think he, he brings it down to a doctor, and he, and he thinks that, well, the doctor probably loses some of, some of the aesthetic appreciation of, of people's bodies, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, it, it might be sad that he loses a bit of the poetry, but the implication here, I think, is that it's really a, a good thing that this doctor looks very carefully at what's going on. So, I did a couple of things here below, uh, different ways that you could write a thesis statement. And I tried to highlight, or I put in bold, the types of words you want to be using in a rhetorical analysis. For example, comparison or contrast or uh, description or analogy. So there's two different uh, ways you could turn this into a thesis statement. I'm not going to go through these because um, I've got quite a bit to do in this uh, video. And I'm also emphasizing 
that you need to analyze what's going on. You need to show how the rhetoric works. You can't just say, here it is, and here it is, and here it is, and here it is. For example, he writes, the sun means that we're going to have wind tomorrow, which is very negative, and it goes along with all the other negative things he's saying. Well, that's, that's kind of like an observation. But you want to turn that into an argument about how Twain's negative descriptions affect the reader in the context of the overall aim of his essay. And so then I give an example of how you do that. So take a good look at these and just make sure that when you're doing your analysis that you're not just pointing something out, that something's there. You want to show how something works. Right? So that's a super important point. Okay, moving on to Al Gore's essay on ships in the desert. Written before uh, he was as famous as he is now for dealing with the environment, and for going for the presidential election. This is written back in 1990. And I've done the same thing with it that I did with the previous essay. I used colors to try to get at certain images and ideas. So I suggest, if you haven't read this essay uh, yet, I suggest that you read it now before you listen to my analysis. Because I'm going to assume that you've read it. I can't, we can't go over the whole thing um, and then do an analysis. We, this video would end up being hours long, right? So I'm assuming that you'll pause the video at this point, read the text if you haven't read it yet. And at the end of this, I suggest that you try to make patterns. Uh, one of the really obvious patterns that I found is a spatial one. It may be obvious that space is important, but how do you analyze it? That's not so obvious. And you can see that here, He's setting up the idea of the Earth, because he says between the North and South Pole. So automatically, you kind of got an image of the world. And then he talks about Tennessee. Then he talks about Amazon. Then he talks about the Canaries. Then he talks about the Equator and the Caribbean. And then he comes back again to the United States. And you'll notice that a lot of these things come back to the United States. They're global things. They're global spaces but they come back to the United States, which is no big surprise, because his audience is in Ameri are American. Uh, he's, a, he's a senator at this point, so it makes sense that he would try to show his audience what he's talking about in terms of American things. So your essay could be about how he talks about these different spaces that are global and brings them to an American audience. And you could also integrate a few other things that are fairly clearly here, but then you'd show the relationship, how they connect to this, these other aspects of space. You could take a look at the way he refers to authority. And a, a biologist is an authority figure when it comes to biology, right? And so when he quotes something by a biologist, <clears throat> we tend to uh, think that it's probably true. He also uh, has these experts talk about specific things, right? Um, or he talks about them. And so he gives some fairly detailed analysis or exposition of things. And so we've got this combination of experts coming in and his opinion, which is also in some ways expert because he's been there. He, he's asserting his authority. He's also asserting his authority in terms that he's a senator, right? And so that maybe perhaps we should listen to him. And he gives a lot of facts. And so the ethos or the authority, the appeal to authority, and the facts are really nicely put together here so that we believe that he's seen these things um, and, or that he's got information on these things. And he always brings it back to the United States. And the final analogy, or the, not analogy, the final scenario is one that happens in the United States. There's another aspect to this essay though, and that is that he brings in uh, the sense that we've got, we've got to be haunted by what's happening. For example, at the end of, and notice it comes in toward the end. So my argument here is that he sets up the spatial situation, which we all know is there, so it's kind of logical. He sets up authority figures who have, who have analyzed these things, or, or himself who has seen these things, and he, you know, he gives them a certain amount of authority because they're biologists or because he's a senator. And so we listen to the explanations. And this is rational, right? So it's a large appeal you know, through space and ethos. It's a big appeal to logic, 
to logos, if you like. If you want to use those Greek terms, terms logos, ethos, and pathos, you could here. It would work very well. The logos is the logic, appeal to our logic. And he's using ethos to help that appeal. But the third one that's really well known in this trinity of Greek strategies, the logos, pathos, and ethos, the third one here is pathos. Um, and it's really important in general. If you want to convince somebody, you could use logic, and that can be very convincing. But there's, I think there's a fair amount of evidence that people are influenced by emotion a lot. And that they decide things or they believe things based on emotion. I mean, I can't back this up completely, but I think there are quite a few uh, studies being done and the mental studies suggest that we don't just decide things logically all the time. That emotion is a huge thing. And if we're going to act on something, we need to be emotionally involved. So, he backs up this this logical explanation of what's going on in the world with a sense that we should feel bad about it. So it also makes sense that this appeal would come after the logical appeals. And so we can see it working, working here in the first paragraph when he talks about destroying one Tennessee's worth of rainforest you know, relating to his American audience, slashed and burned, uh, we, we, we're starting to get description. Um, it gives us statistics, you know, in the sense of um, each square mile of the Amazon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the ending here is really important, which means we are silencing thousands of songs we have never even heard. And this is kind of sad. And this probably makes people think, well, we're hurting ourselves, right? And then this second paragraph uses a very ingenious analogy. Uh, because he says that these things happen in the world. And we don't necessarily know they happen. But we need to be attentive, like the miners are, to the canary that they put into the mine. We need to be attentive, even if nothing happens. So the canary doesn't come back. There's no big sound or, or light that we see. We don't see anything. The canary doesn't come back, because the canaries died in the mine. There's, there's gas in the mine and the canary dies. And so we need to be really attentive to what doesn't happen to what we don't see. And so all of these locations on the earth are far away and we need to pay attention to them. That's what he's suggesting. And it's interesting that he talks about songs we have never heard and of course birds are known to kind of sing. <laughs> um, and he talks about species of birds so there's a kind of a connection here. And so you've got all of these places in the world that we need to, to think about, even though we don't know them very well. Um, he says we should be worried that they're vanishing, and we should be troubled. So when people find ivory, its translucent whiteness should seem to us different. It should seem like evidence of a ghostly presence of a troubled spirit. And notice the language here is completely different. It's not the scientific explanation or exposition. It's very emotional. It's, it's talking about things that aren't scientific at all. As far as I know, <laughs> there, are, there are no such thing as ghosts, as far as I know. Maybe there are ghosts, but I, I don't know. I've never seen one, right? Um, and so it's the language of emotional experience, like evidence of the ghostly presence of a troubled spirit, a beautiful but chill apparition. Notice the one, the, the language is quite poetic at this point. A beautiful but chill apparition inspiring both wonder and dread. Beautifully uh, put sentence there and using words that we don't normally use like apparition. So it's like a ghost. And so the emotional content is quite strong here and here. And then he returns to it again after he's given the very factual account of the slaughter of an, e of an elephant here and the death of uh, coral reefs here. He says, though dead, coral reefs, they shine more brightly than before, haunted, and again, he's using the word haunted, right? Um, and I can't remember, he, does he use the word uh, translucent? 
No, he doesn't use the word haunted here. I think he uses the word uh, inspire wonder and sadness down here. Haunted. I, I thought he used the word haunted up here, but I guess he didn't. Um, no, sorry. Uh, so let's move on a bit. The dead, they, are, they shine more brightly than before. And so here you've got kind of this image of a ghost or maybe even bones and, and, and you know, rattling bones of a skeleton or something that might be a little bit scary. The whiteness of the bones. And then you've got the dead, they more shine brightly than before, haunted perhaps by the same ghost. And so the ghost is like here. It's the troubled spirit or the chill apparition that gives spectral light to an elephant's tusk. And so again, we've got the emotional content tying everything together before we have a scenario that happens in the United States, which ties everything together in a different way because he's been talking about destruction happening in the rest of the world and he's been trying to get us to think about the importance of it using the canary analogy, or even sometimes direct reference to one Tennessee's word. He's been trying to get us to see the importance of these things. And he's been underscoring the importance emotionally. And then he's going to return to the United States. And he brings back this idea of the, the apparition. And he brings back uh, the idea of inspiring wonder and sadness. Because here he said inspiring wonder and dread. So he's highlighting very emotional terms. And these tend to come more toward the end because they can underscore or give emotional power to what you already are convinced about intellectually. So that it's, it's working with that two sides. Oh, maybe there's more than two sides to humans, but there's two, definitely two sides that we can think of, and that is our thinking, our logical thinking, and our emotions. And so he's appealing to both, which makes it um, uh, very strong. And we're not trying to evaluate what he's doing, whether it's strong or it's weak, but you can just see that he's doing that. He's appealing to the two sides. Now, in this uh, particular version, you could sum it up and have a thesis statement that went like this. Gore connects his global scenes and logical explanations to the U.S. and then uses emotional imagery to make Americans feel both responsible for and haunted by environmental destruction. In this second version, I highlight the idea of the emotion, and it's in pink. And at the bottom of it, I give a thesis statement, which is very similar in some ways, but it puts a little bit more emphasis on the emotional side. Gore combines the use of authority, and I give a little bit more detail about specifically what type of authority. And so I, I personally like this second thesis statement better, because it's a bit more specific, and it has a a stronger emphasis on the combination of the logic with the emotion. Gore combines the use of authority, scientists, and his own status as senator, with the use of logic in his global coverage and exposition, and gives these factual strategies, so it's a sort of summary of what went before, an emotional punch by making Americans feel complicit and even fearful of what might happen if they fail to do something. So, uh, that's the, uh, those are the two texts that we're going to look at for today. Now, I'm just going to zip to the uh, main page again, going up to the... Uh